show going a little late, my apologies. But as in life, there is always a little bit of drama and suspense. Just like we had in the Steelers game. Let's sing the song or let's rap. It's Mondays with Mike and Murph. We had a little hiccup, but now we're at the rebirth. We're going to celebrate a good victory Monday. Everybody get together. Let's have fun one way. Let's do it today. There is no other day but today. It's like the movie that I love the most. I'm a Goonie. I'm Chuck. You're the host. Hey, it's Monday with Mikey and Murph. We talking Raiders and football dirt. Because we are a new Raiders talk show. It's time to have fun. What's up, Murph? We are on the air, albeit an hour late. My apologies to the nation, but I did pay my internet bill, but they didn't pay their bill. It was their (laughs) server problems. So if we have issues throughout the show, please forgive me, but we're going to try to deal with it like champions, like the Raiders were, like the Raiders versus the Steelers were. What's going on, Murphy boy? What's up, Mikey? Glad to be here back for another episode of Mondays with Mikey and Murph, man. It's nice to be back on a victory Monday. I could not believe it. The Raiders have been balling out for all the players they got through the purge. They've been balling out and they brought some heart and passion the previous couple weeks. And I'm thrilled. Even though I'm a Gruden hater, I'm starting to enjoy this. I'm glad you're not backing down and away from that because if I see one more person buy into and, and, and celebrate the Raiders after talking smack about them for the last 10 weeks, I'm going to puke. It's all over social media, man. I'm, I'm just so glad that you at least remain truthful to the fact that you were a hater. And uh, you know what I mean? It, it may, I, I, I respect that, Mikey. You know, I, I respect the uh, I respect anybody that, gets, that that maintains a position. But the key word there is maintain. Don't get flip floppy. You know what I mean? Like just a few weeks ago, man, everybody wanted to freaking run this guy out of town. They wanted to fire everybody. Car was terrible, blah, blah, blah. Now, all of a sudden, the guy hasn't thrown an interception. I don't know how for forever since we played the Chargers and uh, and Gruden's got him rolling, man. He's got him buying in, and so uh, it's it's nice to see. But uh, I'm telling you, it's kind of funny, man, how people like to flip flop. It's like just you know, call your shot and stick with it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I'm not a Raider hater. You said I'm, you know, glad you're admitting you're a hater. Not of the Raiders, of Gruden and his decision making, and he did something to piss me off again. And we're gonna talk about this. But in general, the guy's coaching. And I'm proud to see that I can change my mind about anybody. If I hate you at first, doesn't mean I doesn't mean I can't can't love you at the end. You know what I'm saying? Exactly right. So that's the way it is. All right. This is Victory Mondays with Mike and Murph. Let everybody know where else they can find you, Murph, with your awesome T-shirt. Yeah, thanks. I got the Goodfellas shirt working today, man. And uh, you can find us at Murph's Fan Cave. That's M-U-R-F-S Fan Cave. Uh, we are on uh, we are on the YouTubes, we are on the Twitters, we are on the Facebooks, we are on the uh, uh, on the Google Plays, on the uh, on the on the iTunes and the Apple Podcastings and the Stitchers and the Spotify's and pretty much anywhere that you can find a podcast or any other such uh, service, you can find us. Just search Murph's Fan Cave. And most importantly, though, please hit that subscribe button, especially on the YouTube, which we're becoming big fans of. We do a live stream every Wednesday night right here from Murph's Fan Cave. So please check it out. And I appreciate you asking, Mikey. Yeah, support them, man. They have a good time. They got good um, chemistry host. You know what? I needed that in my life. So I'm really happy that every week I can catch some amazing stuff on MervsFanCave.com. Links will be below. All right. Since we started late and we're all a little disappointed at the Internet and Google and Spectrum or whoever's running this matrix of a world. Let's get into the headlines, red lines, deadlines. They blow my mind. Murph, rent is going to be a Fox special in January. Oh, my gosh. You're going to get your bowl of popcorn ready, buddy. Cranking up the sound. Let's go on this Victory Monday. Thank you, God. Victory! Oh, man, you got to love it. You got to love it. I look forward to that each and every Monday in the future, hopefully. Basically, the Steelers were upset. That's the headline for the day in both ways. They were upset from us, according to the experts, and they were upset because we got a big victory and kind of hurt their playoff chances a little little bit. So that's the headline. We'll get into the game review. 
But breaking news, not really to us, we spoke about this on many occasions. Reggie McKenzie was officially fired. He's on his way out of Oakland as there is going to be a major front office overhaul. We all expected it. I thought it should have happened before the season, uh, you know, because I knew Gruden was going to bring in his own people. But I guess Gruden decided to try to work with him just like he did with Amari Cooper <laughs> before he made an initial decision. So, Murph, your take on Reggie being fired, too little, too late, and who should replace him? Yeah, you know, Reggie was a lame duck GM. You know, we knew that he was on his way out, as you mentioned. So this comes to surprise of no one in Raider Nation. I think I'm a little surprised that it happened midseason. Uh, the report came out uh, yesterday, which oh, don't you love it? How multi or no, I always call multimedia. Don't you love it? How how mainstream media likes to drop bombs on the Raiders right before our games on Sundays. Like, isn't that so sweet of them? Like, if you don't think there's a media bias against the Raiders, Raider Nation, then I don't know what you're watching because it, it, all you got to do is pay a little bit of attention. You see how they how they take shots at us uh, repeatedly. Uh, but anyways, so the, the bomb drops, and so it just. You know, it creates an uncomfortable situation that you know that the guy's on his way out. So uh, they gave him the opportunity to stay on through the end of the season. He chose not to. I wouldn't. I don't blame him. I, I wouldn't want to stay on either, especially when you're going through the the scouting process. You know, your words would ring hollow when you're talking to uh, to young athletes coming out of college. You know, so um, you know, I, I understand his his wanting uh, to move on. And you know, the thing that's interesting about this is that. It's not a contentious relationship. Both he and Gruden will tell you, we get along. We like each other. And that's always been the interesting thing to me through this process is that I thought I thought for sure he would uh, maybe stay on in some other capacity. Maybe be like a money guy or something, which he's very good at. He's very good when it comes to contracts and structuring and things like that. So I thought maybe he might stick around for something like that. But clearly not not going to be the case that it's going to be the Gruden's guys and nothing but that. And that's, but you know, again, that's no shocker to us, right? Like we kind of knew this was the way uh, that it was going to go. And especially when he started getting rid of Reggie's draft picks, right? Like there weren't very many of them left to begin with anyways. I think out of the 50 guys that Reggie yeah. drafted, there was only a handful of them left over anyways. And uh, what handful of them were left uh, Gruden pretty much got rid of. So uh, I don't think this, yeah, again, comes as a surprise to Reggie or, or anybody else. And, you know, they pull, better to pull off the Band-Aid, though. You know what I mean? Better to get get the people in. What's interesting to me, Mikey, is that who we're going to end up with. You hear Bruce Allen. You hear yep. my my speculations, Holmgren. And I kind of like the Holmgren angle. You didn't ask, but I'll float this out there to you because I'm I, curious on your, your response. Uh, Holmgren's a San Jose guy. You know, he's a, he's a Bay Area dude. Uh, he knows what it's like to win Super Bowls. He's got three rings, two as a coordinator, one as a head coach. He knows what it's like to mold the young quarterback and Brett Favre and Steve Young and, uh, you know, you know, a handful of other Hall of Famers. So I kind of like the idea of Mike Holmgren. You know, he, he had good success in Seattle afterwards, even grooming Matt Hasselbeck, right? So I think that he's got a lot to offer, and he's the kind of guy that could command respect from John Gruden because there's only going to be a handful of people in the world, Mikey, that are going to do that that are going to not be puppets, right? That they're going to actually be able to not only work with John, but challenge him at times if need be. And I think Holmgren's one of those guys that could definitely do that. What do you think? I didn't even think about Holgren. Now you remind me that Holgren made a visit about a month ago to the Raiders yep. front office and everything. And there were pictures of him on the internet. And yeah, I didn't even think about that till you brought it up. That definitely looks like a possibility if Holmgren doesn't want to come back to coaching, wants to come back in another aspect, definitely. Yeah, and he's not, I, and whoever this is isn't going to be a full blown GM, right? They called him. What did he refer to in the press conference today? A front office executive or something? Like he didn't he didn't call him a GM, right? Well, we all know that Gruden is the de facto <laughs> yeah, yeah. GM. Let's let's call it what it is. Bruce Allen, though, you know, he worked with Gruden many years yeah. ago. They got a history, but he's in Washington right now with the Redskins. But you all know what's going on in Washington, so he could easily be released or, you know, take this job if that comes about it. But you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to side with you on the whole Grim thing because in a conspiracy world, with him showing up a month ago, it kind of makes a lot of sense, Murph. But all right, back to my Gruden hatred. <laughs> and his decision making. Um, again, I thought Gruden should have let go McKenzie, you know, in the beginning of the season. During the um, NFL Combine, he was already calling out McKenzie's draft picks. 
from the previous seasons, whether they were his or Del Rio's or whoever. But Gruden was calling him out at the NFL Combine. He was already setting up a stage to get rid of McKenzie, but he didn't do it. So we went into the season with McKenzie. Then he got rid of all the draft picks that he didn't like, whatever, for various reasons. And then I made a video saying Reggie McKenzie should quit now. Just get out. You know, save some face. Look better. But they finally fired him. And again, in midseason. But Gruden's decision to keep Reggie on this entire year might have been for his own benefit so he can overhaul the money again in terms of salary cap and trades all out with Amari Cooper, Khalil Mack. And now once all of that work was done by McKenzie, now they officially fire him. But this is what bothers my britches. There's the Raiders' official statement on Reggie. I'm not even going to read into it. But um, John Gruden was asked at the press conference after the game, once news hit that Reggie was fired, he said, I really didn't have a sense in it. I've been in a dark shaft room trying to get ready for the next game. This is all somewhat surprising. There's been a lot of speculation and a lot of rumors coming out here since early in the season. He's deflecting. He's not even saying he had a hand in it. He's saying, I, I don't know. I've been in a room coaching. You know, I don't know. There's been a lot of rumors since the beginning of the season. You started those rumors by calling out his players, Gruden. I mean, can you stop deflecting and take ownership? Or did, from your opinion, Murph, did Mark Davis finally grab his big boy pants and is Mark Davis making all these decisions moving forward? And honestly, Gruden has no clue on what's going on. It just bothered me. Yeah, I don't think there's ever a case where anybody has no clue what's going on. I, that's never going to be the, the truth behind any of this stuff. And that's pretty much goes for any NFL team. I mean, you have to get to some serious levels of dysfunction for anybody to quote not know what's going on so everybody knows what's going on it's just a matter of how much they want to share you know and, and you know I think that your criticism of Gruden uh, at times can be fair in terms of you know he's not very good at being forthcoming at times he's not very good at at, at delivering certain message or crafting certain messages uh, in, in terms of uh, his his release of information you know, and, and I think that those are fair criticisms of, of, of him. You know, I don't ever think he's lying. I don't ever think he's, you know, being deceitful or trying to manipulate the situation. I don't ever, that stuff I don't believe. But what I do believe is he, he doesn't want to throw people under the bus, but he doesn't necessarily, look, he's a football coach. And even though he's a good broadcaster, he's not a brilliant orator. Like he's not a politician, right? He doesn't know how to say, you know, these are the decisions that we've made around the general manager, you know, his job has never even really been defined publicly. So you, he's not going to, so he's kind of dancing around these things as far as how they arrive to certain decisions. And there's a little bit of past the buck between him and Mark, because ultimately if Mark was the one that made the call, well, then Mark would have conducted the freaking press conference. You know what I mean? Like then why, then why parade Gruden out there? If, if it's uh you know, if it's Mark's call and uh, you know what I mean? So there's a lot of this stuff doesn't really, you know, this is two and two equals five. You know what I mean? Like some of it just doesn't really work. But do I have an expectation as a fan that, that I'm, they're going to reveal everything? No. I mean, could they do a better job of polishing the message a little bit? Sure. That, and, I, and I think that's fair. But at the end of the day, we know what really happened. Like, do we really got to ask? And, you know, and that's the thing that like and where I get a little, a little crossed up with some of the. Um, some of the reporters that it's like, you know, what are you asking? What do you, what do you want to get? Like, we all know, you know what the answer to this question is. So what are you trying to get out of it? You're trying to get a sound bite. You're trying to get a click. You're trying to get somebody to say something inflammatory so you can plaster it on the front of your blog or your whatever. And so that's, you know, whatever this, I don't get too, I don't get too worked up about this again. Is it fair to criticize Gruden on the messaging at times? Absolutely. Have at it. But I think that if that's the thing that we have to be critical of him about, then Okay, I'd rather players bought in. You know what I mean? Yeah, the issue for me is, again, I mean, you stated it correctly. You said Gruden doesn't want to throw people under the bus, but I beg to differ. He's thrown plenty of players and people under the bus in his statements after press conferences or in preseason to my dish record. But I don't know. This feels like maybe Gruden, it just feels like he's deflecting. You're right. He probably now, after all the media attention, doesn't want to 
throw people under the bus or admit it's his it's his decision because everybody mm-hmm. thinks the Raiders right now are completely 100% controlled by John Gruden because he's got a hundred million dollar contract you know every decision that's been made everybody's like oh Gruden traded Mac Gruden traded Cooper Gruden yeah. did this Gruden did that and and I think now maybe Mark Davis and Gruden are kind of like deflecting and putting the blame on another person. So Gruden can kind of get away with it and saying, I had no hand. I've been too busy coaching, you know, so I don't know what's going on. That's the front office situation with uh, Mark Davis and whoever else. So I'm just busy coaching. That's the message I want to send. And it kind of deflects away from him being a part of the McKenzie firing. I don't like the deflection. I believe it's honestly a little disrespectful because we all know Gruden knew what was going on, but was the ultimate decision Gruden or Mark Davis? They're putting that out there. So we think twice about it. It's probably both, but you know what? And and we got to remember that these things don't happen exclusive of one another. I mean, there's probably a lot of both, you know, Mark came out, Mark, I, I like Mark Davis, man. And I, and I, you know, he came out early on and I'm paraphrasing, but basically he said, look, I'm not a football guy. I'm going to hire football people to do football stuff. It's just like Robert Kraft, right? Like you have owners like Jerry Jones who will think they're football guys and go on and try to take over. And then you have guys like Bob Kraft who are like, you go do football. Like I'll just own the team and handle that part of it. You go do that. Well, that's what Mark is like. He's Mark. That's why he hired Dennis Allen and let him linger around for as long as he did because he was going to let it, the football guy do the football stuff. And so, you know, I think that when Gruden comes in, who Davis trusts immensely, and he says, hey, boss, you know, this roster we have isn't bad, but there's some glaring holes in it, and we have some major issues pending when it comes to contracts and come to the longevity of the, the you know, the, the competitiveness of this team. And here's what I think we need to do. And, you know, look, Reggie, you know, kind of drop the ball on a handful of things. And then, you know, Mark, is is it feasible to think that Davis is, well, is this somebody we need to move on from? And Gruden say, ah, you know, it's probably not a bad idea. He's a nice guy, but, you know, he probably he, he hadn't really put together the roster that we had all hoped he would after five years. You know what I mean? Like, these are the kind of conversations that have gone on. So to, to think that they happen individually of each other, no, absolutely not. It's definitely a collaborative effort. And frankly, you know, McKenzie was probably fully aware of it. You don't hear him screaming from the rooftops. He knows. He's not a dumb guy. You know what They're I mean? They're technically making it look individual by Gruden's I statement agree. saying I, I wasn't involved. I can see he's, that. He's making it look individual. And a month ago, Mark Davis had the interview with Paul G where Mark Davis said, oh, I don't like Reggie's decisions. Reggie's draft class have um, not been good. So that kind of put Mark Davis in the forefront. And I mean, technically, why couldn't Gruden say we mutually came to a decision? Why can't John Gruden just say that? I don't know. Again, and that's where you can be critical of them. Again, the, the delivery of the message is not what we would all want it to be. But what is it? But at the end of the day, here we've spent, you know, 15 minutes talking about it. What does it change? It doesn't change or nor matter. And while fandom is all fun and speculation and none of our opinions change the outcome of the team anyways. But still, though, I mean, I mean, what is it at the end of the day? Like, if that's the thing at the end of the day, Dennis Allen, let me put my red Sharpie in my ear. If, if At the end of the day, if that's what really we get hung up on about Gruden is his messaging. Well then fine. Like, okay. Like I'll take that again. I'd, I'd, I'd rather have players bought in now that weren't before than a guy that has a polished message when it comes to a tough decision to make in, in front office personnel. Like, okay. Like I'll, no, look, you know it's I mean? all good. We got a victory, you know, let's move on again. Just me. I've been critical of the decision-making and then I just wanted a little bit of transparency and I still don't seem to be getting it from Gruden. So I'm still a little irked, but we got a victory. And Marshawn Lynch is now named the man of the year nominee for the Raiders. It's a, a treat to see that. I think, I truly think he deserves it. And um, we won't play the audio. It, it's a few minutes long and, you know, we got to get going with this show, but I wanted to congratulate Marshawn quickly Um, unfortunately, I don't think you're going to be playing this year for the Raiders. We don't know about next year, but congratulations, Marshawn. You made a believer out of me. I didn't like you at first, but again, I came around and you've been nothing but a class act. And all I can do is say congratulations and I hope you win. 
your thoughts on this, Murph? Yeah, I'm with you. You know, after the incident last year with Marcus Peters, you know, Marshawn wasn't my favorite guy to wear a Raider uniform at the time, and I was plenty critical. You know, just again, I'll, I'll owe my criticism of him. I was pissed. I was pissed at the idea that he went and stuck up for a goddamn chief. I don't care where you're from. He's wearing that stupid ketchup and mustard and mayo jersey, and you're wearing silver and black, and they're playing on our turf. You go to bat for the silver and black. You don't go to bat for the for a freaking chief. Again, I don't care what neighborhood he's from. But that said, but that, so I was pissed. But that aside, everything else he's ever done has been the most Raider things ever. And his philanthropy and, and it, you know, everything that he's done it, it with his charitable organizations and all the wonderful causes and things that he's committed to. He's earned my respect, man. I got a ton of respect for Marshawn and I, and it's, I hate it. it the idea that he's not going to get a chance to say goodbye to the Oakland fans uh, while in uniform. Maybe we'll get it next year. I don't know. It's everything. Everything is so far up in the air in terms of next year that who knows what we'll see. But if there's an opportunity for that to happen, I think that that would be a great thing for him. You know, he's not the kind of guy to grab a microphone like Charles Woodson did and address the crowd or anything. But just to give that one last, you know, wave, dance, you know, grab the golf cart and drive around the stadium. I don't know, whatever it is, that whatever uh-huh. Marshawn thing he wants to do, I hope he gets a chance and an opportunity to do that. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, congrats, Marshawn, and good luck. Uh, last week, uh, I was watching the game, and I didn't even understand it either. It confused me, but Dwayne Hare's special teams, he was coached up by Basaccia or whatever, but he made one of the most intelligent plays in special teams football with the ball out of bounds. Let's actually listen to the this video. You might not be able to hear it, Murph, for the situations, but by him stepping out of bounds on this play, it created more yardage, and it got the ball at the 40-yard line. And it's just very intelligent, and I'm proud to see that. So amazing, uh, that play where he put his foot out of bounds, touched the ball to get us an extra 20 yards instead of letting it become a touchback. Your thoughts on that? I just – it blew my mind. So I was like, wow. Yeah, I don't know how intentional it was, but it was a good play. You know, I <laughs> I, I think he just, you know, kind of stepped out there and fortune – uh, had his favor, or uh, you know, so I don't know. I, it's it's a, it's an interesting play if you think about it. It's not a bad strategic move if you could do it as the kicking team. If you could do it with any kind of consistency, because that's a live football. That's not like a punt where you can down it. The other team could pick that thing up and score a touchdown with it. Like if you just, or even if you just let it bounce and lay in the end zone, like the other team can land, can go get that thing. So it's kind of an interesting concept to kind of let the thing bounce, but especially cough and cornered like that. So, cause I mean, one thing it's, it's going to be a flag. It's uh, it, uh, illegal procedure. And the other way it goes uh, as a touchback, but one way or the other, like you can't just let it lay there though, either as the, as the receiver, you know, so Harris was really caught between you know uh, a funky position there and thankfully it worked out because he had his foot out of bounds but that's I, I i saw that you ever play madden mikey you know of course okay i learned that lesson playing madden way back when once upon a time i let a kick go and it was just laying there in the end zone i thought well i don't want to return this because i don't want to get my guy blown up before i even get to the 20 yard line so I just let the ball sit there in the end zone. I just left my guy standing there. And then the other guy ran down and landed, you know, dove on the football and touchdown. Touchdown. Yeah. And I'm like, Oh my gosh. I'm like, well, well, cause it's a live football. So you, you, so you as the receiver, you know, you can't do that. You got to You got to make a choice there. So again, thankfully he had his foot out of bounds and it worked out in favor of the Raiders, but that was, I don't remember ever seeing that. That was a very, very unique play in the NFL. Well, yeah, it never went in the end zone. That was the point. No, it had to yeah. be on the sidelines. Yeah. And it went, like, within the one-yard line. And, you know, he's like, I'm that close to the sidelines. Hopefully he thought this. You made up a good point. But he's like, if I put my foot out of bounds, I get it before it goes into a touchback. I'm out of bounds. I grab the ball at the one-yard line. Then that penalty ensues, and it becomes on the 40-yard line. Whether he truly knew it or not, I'm going to say I think he did. He's been around the league a lot, but I don't know. It was just a beautiful play. It confused the announcers. It confused me. And now in retrospect, (laughs) the Raiders players have been being coached up or making some good decisions. And that was the reason for this story. Uh, This report came out from Benjamin Albright. I don't know how to phrase the question, but I'm going to try my best. My brain is too wild. But Benjamin Albright said, what if I told you Gruden wasn't the reason Mack and Cooper were traded at all? 
What if an owner, meaning Mark Davis, got so angry at an agent declining a fair offer that he vowed not to have that agent's player on his team and began trading them away? So that saying that he may believe that Mark Davis gave Khalil Mack a fair offer in February when they hired Gruden, that the agent turned it down and wanted more money, and then Mark Davis maybe in his insecure butt, just like he did with Oakland, the city of Oakland, when they raised the rent, that he said, I am not going to deal with this agent anymore. I am so mad. I'm going to trade these players away. I'm going to see what happens. I'm never going to deal with this guy again. Do you think that's what happened? That Gruden was forced to trade Mac from Mark Davis making these decisions against the agent? No, again, I don't I don't believe any of these decisions are made. You don't give somebody keys to the kingdom a hundred million dollars in a ten year contract if you don't if you're just gonna tell them what to do. If you just need somebody to you know be a yes man, then you just keep Jack Del Rio in the building. You know what I mean? So I, I don't I don't I don't believe that or Dennis Allen even. I don't I don't believe that for one second that it, that Mark Davis dictated based on a singular experience. Now what I do f- feel though is that is there truth to this story? Absolutely. And Joel Siegel is a pain in the neck, and and I'm glad that the that his clients are not part of the football team because I don't I as a fan do not want to see an agent hang up the progression of the competitiveness of my favorite football team. So if if we don't have to deal with them, it, look, if there are there people in your life, even in your business life, that cross you up and you say, you know what? No, I'm not going to deal with you anymore. The number one rule of negotiation is the willingness to walk away. And Mark Davis was willing to walk away, man. And I don't, I don't blame him. I, I, don't, I don't blame him one bit. I, I think that these, these agents and these tactics, I think it's petty. I think it's, uh, it, it's, it doesn't do the league any good. Look, look at Le'Veon Bell, man. The guy missed out $14 million a year he left sitting on the table this year. $14 million bucks. You telling me in any any capacity that was a good decision, and I promise you it wasn't him. I promise is Joe you. Joe Siegel, his agent. Let's find I don't, out. I, yeah, I don't know who his agent is, but I promise you that's the person. See, because here's what here's the the thing: the agents are the only ones that truly win on this kind of stuff. Who won in the Khalil Mack deal? Who won biggest in Khalil Mack deal? The freaking agent did. Joe Siegel won more than anybody. The Raiders didn't lose. You, you know what I mean? It's in terms of their, their compensation, but they lost out on the on having that guy's production on the field. The Bears had to give up a freaking fortune for him. You know, Khalil Mack ruins his reputation with Oakland. You know what I mean? Like, you think about all the different things that happen. Uh, who wins? Joel, what did Joel Siegel sacrifice? What, did, what was one single thing that that agent had to sacrifice in moving him over? What did he have to sacrifice in, in getting Amari Cooper traded over to the, to the Cowboys? Nothing. Nothing. And Amari Cooper is going to get a big contract from Jerry Jones. And it's just anyways. Uh, so I don't I don't blame Davis one single bit for not being willing to deal with 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 Joel Siegel if that were the case. And so, yeah, is there conversations between Gruden and and Davis that say, you know what, this isn't somebody we choose to do business with then, you know. Yeah, that happened. You know, sometimes collusion isn't necessarily everybody getting in a room and going, okay, we're all going to get together and screw this guy over. Instead, maybe it's you're a jackass and we don't like you and we don't want to deal with you. So, you know what I mean? And we collectively decided you're a jackass. So, you know what I mean? It's not part of any grandmaster plan. It's just that, look, you're just not somebody we choose to do business with. Yeah, this goes back to the narrative that we were talking about earlier, where most of us for the longest time thought almost every decision was from Gruden, even the Khalil Mack trade with the agent. So this um, changes the narrative, this statement by Benjamin Albright about Mark Davis. So it makes us kind of think that maybe Gruden, because of Mark Davis's hatred with the agent, was also not completely forced, but it started the decision making Like, let's see what Khalil Mack does if he comes in. And, you know, if he doesn't come in, then we're totally done. We're going to figure it out, and it's totally done. But it kind of shows that maybe John Gruden wasn't the actual 100% trade maker by this statement. Absolutely not. Absolutely not he wasn't. And let's – and listen – you could call him, not you, the proverbial you, can call him, 
could call him Tommy Boy, can make fun of his haircut, can you know make fun of his minivan and going to P.F. Chang's and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, this man's name is Davis, and he is Al Davis's son. And if you think Al Davis would have put up with any of those shenanigans that Joel Siegel was putting on it on the table, then you are sorely mistaken because Al Davis gave a big F you to anybody and everybody that ever thought to challenge him. Well, guess what? This is his kid. He learned how to run this organization from his dad. Now, granted, he's not his dad, and he does a lot of things different, and he's defining his own legacy. But at the end of the day, he's still got some Davis in him. You know what I mean? You're completely right. Early on, once he took over the team after his dad's death, whether he had balls or, you know, fight in him, I don't know. But now after the Oakland situation, him getting all that hatred, the NFL, moving to Vegas, John Gruden, I think he's starting to grab a little bit of his balls and make a few decisions on his own. I think Mark Davis is trying to be a big boy. So I completely agree with that. Listen, he did. He's doing something his dad never did. And he's getting the Raiders a stadium, which is something that the Raiders have wanted since what year? 19. What year did they move to L.A.? What, 1980, what, uh, two, one, one, whatever. I don't remember. I, I, oh, 80. It must have been 81. 80, I don't even remember. Yeah. So anyway, so there you go. So ever since then, Al Davis, because he moved to L.A. with the intention of building that one in Englewood, right, or wherever the heck it was going, somewhere, they weren't. They didn't go down there to go play at the Coliseum. They went down there with the idea that another stadium was going to get built, and it never did. So since then, so how long is that? 40 years the Raiders have been trying to get a stadium built, and this is the guy that did it. It's Mark Davis. It's not Al Davis. And Mark Davis is the one that added a billion dollars worth of value to the franchise. So, anyways, uh, I digress. But it, it's well, there it is. It's not only Gruden making decisions, which is blowing my mind because that's what I thought. Now it's Mark Davis and John Gruden. But speaking of more hatred from Joel uh, Siegel, this guy. Mark, I just I can't believe this. It just bothers me. That's why I'm going to show it, but we don't have to talk about it. Amari Cooper won another big game, you know, luckily, whatever, for the Cowboys. And then he had a statement on television saying, on joining the Cowboys now after another big game. It's a dream come true. When I was young, I thought about playing in the NFL. This is the experience I thought about. Everything from the city, the facility, winning, playing with passion. It's exciting. It's a dream come true. He never said that when he was drafted for the Raiders. He never said that type of stuff that he's proud to be in the NFL. I mean, oh, my God, Amari Cooper. I'm done with you, dude. Last thoughts on Amari Cooper, and then I promise you I'm bringing him up no more. Yeah, I'm with you. This is He's going to go quickly to the names that shall not be spoken. There's a handful of them on our show, and uh, he's now going to be one of them. And talk about, are you a wrestling fan, Mikey? Did you ever watch wrestling? Oh, man, of course. Okay. This guy took the heel turn of all heel turns, man. He's now he's at the point now where he's cutting promos, uh, you know, against the rate. Like, what the heck? Like, I mean, all of a sudden, like, where did this guy's personality come from? And he's talking about all his passion and he's shooting free throws and he's like, and I'm like, are really? Like, this is the guy. Like, no wonder you're gone. Thank goodness you're gone. Because if this is the kind of sad sack, poor ass attitude that he was bringing to the Raiders, we don't need you, dude. See you goodbye, man. I'm. Talk about being let down, man. I thought for the most, the majority of this season, Bruce Irvin was the biggest um, uh, letdown of the year, considering that the Raiders made him a captain and he just, you know, he was just, just not invested at all, especially after Cleo Mack got traded. And then, but now this, this, this might beat out Bruce Irvin, man. I, I'm telling you, Amari Cooper is doing himself no favors at all in terms of uh, he's public. He's smiling. Raiders. He's on yeah. camera. He's talking with with class. He was all shy with the Raiders. Didn't want to yeah. talk to nobody. Now he's got. He's doing commercials. He's trying to get paid. How- how so do you congratulations, Jamari Cooper, but you don't need to disrespect the Raiders while you do it. How do like, you feel? If, how do you feel if you're Derek Carr? How do you feel if you're? Rodney Hudson or uh, Kelechi or any of these guys that are that are totally bought in and invested into the team. And I'm talking about even before Gruden. Like, how do you if if there I mean, gosh, Derek used to I mean, speak glowingly about Amari Cooper. I mean, like they were best buddies, man. And you're and he's just crapping on all of that. Like, I'm 20 kinds of pissed off if I'm a Raider in that locker room, man. Like, I just unbelievable that this guy Joel I mean, Siegel, Khalil Mack, Amari Cooper I don't know Murph you might not want to agree but Amari Cooper was decent didn't talk in the media but after the Washington game again if you think something happened Amari Cooper was never the same Khalil Mack was never the same 
and then they all wanted off the team. The agent got involved. Man, this is scary, but I'm done with you, Mark Cooper. I will not speak your words. Hopefully no more, except in a viral video. <laughs> Sorry, they get views. All right, Vegas land prices are booming around the stadium, uh, according to reports. So everybody's buying up, you know, either liquor stores or restaurants or whatever around the parking lots or whatever. And it's costing them a lot of money, which means land prices are booming. Uh, that is to be expected, especially in the first few years of the Raiders joining Vegas. But uh, what are your thoughts on the, the prices booming? Good, bad? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, this is what happens when you invest into a, into a you know, a modern day sports facility like this. It's going to do more than just house those sporting events, right? They're going to have concerts and all that kind of stuff. And this is what the Raiders had in mind. Uh, when they talked to the, to the to Oakland, they wanted to do Coliseum City and have it, you know, grow up the area around it. Because I don't know when last time you went to the Coliseum was. Uh, I was there earlier this year, and it's still a dump, and everything around it is still got weak accommodations at best. Like it's not like most every other NFL city I've ever been to. You go to the stadium, and then all around the the, the stadium, there are bars and restaurants and shops, and there are tons of things to do. You know what I mean? Tons of things out in walking distance before and after the game. It's a blast to go and you can spend all day and night around the football game. But at the Coliseum, you don't do that. You go in and you get out. You know what I mean? Like, that's it. There's nothing to do around there. You get on the interstate and you go home or whatever. You're back to where you're staying. Um, so anyway, so th this this is, you know, this is what happens around, you know, uh, around uh, uh, that's the trickle down of the economics. And it's sad that Oakland never had an opportunity uh, to realize, well, I take that back. It's sad that Oakland never afforded themselves the opportunity to realize this. It's sad that it that it's got to happen in Vegas. But yeah, this is what happens, man. This is the whole the whole point of of them being willing to uh, to dedicate public funds to it is because it manifests itself in other forms of revenue, which is all the real estate and all the businesses and jobs and all that stuff, all the infrastructure that goes up around a stadium. So good for them, Murph. If I could afford it. I would make a restaurant, I'd call it Murph's Vegan Tacos for a healthy Raider Nation living. Murph's Vegan Tacos. And, right. and we would have we would have what we had when we hung out. Cauliflower yeah. chicken hot wings. Yeah, man. Those are good, huh? Yeah, he brought me to cauliflower hot wings and they're pretty darn good. Yeah, and I've man. eaten them on a few occasions. Yeah, they're good, man. They're good. They're not as good as a regular old chicken wing, man, but they're good. When you're, you're trying to make some different lifestyle choices, that's what's, what's one to eat. Let's do it. Murph's Vegan Tacos <laughs> around Vegas Raider Stadium. Hey, Let's our go. buddy, uh, while we're on the subject, real quick, our buddy uh, Raider Jeff from DeadPirateSports.com, he's one of these guys. Oh, you mean living out there in Vegas? Well, he's going to, yeah, he's, 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 uh, Dead Pirate Sports is like, they've got a Raider bar out there that they've already decorated and like they're committed to. And like, and I don't, I don't know all the gory details of everything he's got going on out there. And I don't think it's fair for me to even talk about it publicly, but just know this. He's got, he's one of those guys that are in, that's in the mix of all this kind of stuff. Cause there's, and there is, there's tons of it going on, man. And it's really, really cool stuff. I can't, it's yeah, going to be like a freaking Raider land out there, man. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, there's a few Raider bars out there that I've known of. I haven't been there recently, but check out deadpiratesports.com. Jeff, I call him Jeff Raider. He's an amazing man. He runs deadpiratesports.com. A lot of good values on merchandise and stuff from real Raider Nation. So check it out. Uh, and speaking of Amari Cooper disrespecting the Raiders, we had a Bronco before he became a Raider. <laughs> with, he was with the Broncos, and he was still respecting the Raiders yeah. while he was a Bronco. I'm talking about C.J. Anderson. His family is 100% and himself, but he he couldn't admit it while he was in Denver. He's 100% diehard Raiders. Listen to, this is from a press conference last year when he was with Denver, talking about when they had to play the Raiders and what his family was going to do. Are there still uh, Raiders fans in your family? Or Plenty of them. They'll be there. My mom will be, my, my, my little brother. They'll be there. When 22 is in the game, they'll root for us. And when I'm out the game, they're going to root for the Raiders. So I feel bad for Jamal and them. What do they wear? <laughs> I don't know. It's not neutral. They won't put on orange and blue. But they won't put on black and silver either. So <laughs> that's, that's, you know, that's a good thing. So you haven't converted them completely? It's tough. My mom goes every time. You know, she criticized me. But every time she goes, look, you know I'm a Raider fan. I love you, son. But just not against my Raiders. You know, it's, it's, it's heart. 
heart heart warm right there. You know, it hits home. It hits home when it comes to my mom. Gonna be like that when they go to Vegas. Yeah, it's, it's a free trip to Vegas. That's how she look at it. Free trip on my dime. <laughs> son, I want to go to Vegas see the Raiders play. All right, mom, here you go. You know, now she got her other son over there, Marshawn. Now she just hit him up for tickets, and boom, there it goes. It all works out. <laughs> Look at this guy speaking good about Marshawn, about his family being Raiders. Can't wait to go to Vegas while he was a Bronco. That's a Raider. I hope he's a part of the team next year. I really do. I hope he can find a name for himself. Yeah, that's cool, man. And I love it how mom refers to them as my Raiders. That's the best, man. That's the best. Like I love you, son, but those are my Raiders. You go, mama. I love it. I love it. So I just wanted to present that story because it's a good story. I love it. So good luck, CJ. I hope we can figure out a way, you know, to have you a part of this team moving forward. That would be fun to see you and your mom, all that. Uh, whoops, I got to get my video up. Real quickly, do you believe the Cowboys cheated in a Spygate too by having a person on the sidelines of the New Orleans Saints game? Yes, I believe all this stuff. I think that this stuff happens all the time. And uh, I, we had Randy Hansen, former uh, Raiders defensive backs coach on, uh, on Raiders fan radio for uh, a lengthy interview that ended up being a four part series. Um, and he spoke a lot about this kind of stuff about not only having other teams on the sidelines, but you, you want to talk about deflate gate. How about Brad Johnson and Rich Gannon both had theirs deflated in that Super Bowl? Um, that it's just this is commonplace, man. This kind of stuff happens all the time. It's just a matter of who gets caught when, and you know. So this stuff does not surprise me. And look, we invented this. You know what I mean? When you look, when the, there used to be a sign in the Raiders locker room that said, uh, "Cheating is in, number one. Cheating is encouraged. Number two, see number one." <laughs> and that was a sign that hung up in the Raiders locker room. We invented a lot of this stuff. It, they, I don't think that the Raiders ever, you know, fully crossed a line intentionally, but they pushed it as far as they could possibly push it, man. You know what I mean? Like, was stick them illegal? No. But will they? You, when you literally coat your limbs from the elbow and the knee down and stick them, is that in the spirit of the idea of it? No. But we did it anyways. You know what I mean? And all you had to do was watch highlights of this this uh, uh, during the this last game with the they were showing the old Raiders Steelers stuff. Atkinson's coming up behind Lynn Swan and clocking him in the back of the head. I'm pretty sure even back then that wasn't legal. You know what I mean? But you know what I'm saying? Like, we kind of invented this stuff. So d did they do this? Probably. Does it surprise me? No, because I think it happens all the time in the NFL. One last thing I'll tell you. You know, Randy had – he made a good point. Um, earlier in the check, year – Check out – real quick. Check out the Randy Hansen tapes on Murph Fan Cave, the YouTube channel. It's amazing. But I'm sorry. Go on. I appreciate you saying that. It was. It was very revealing to me. It was amazing. But he said, you know, he 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 – he made mention that there are times throughout the course of the NFL season where he says teams, he says, I'll get something on you. He says, I've got them. I've got them. And what he was talking about was that there's something they know. They've got some inside information. He goes, you ever wonder about how when you're watching the NFL season, he goes, and a team like Buffalo just goes and beats Minnesota out of nowhere at home. He's like, you ever wonder why a team so bad beats a team so good? And I'm like, yeah, it is. It's, he goes, it's because they got them. It's because they got something on them. And, it, and it's there's something like this that's gone on. They get some sort of inside information probably based on the, not the most scrupulous of activities to acquire said, said information. And when you get them, you get them. And it, they, just like Tampa Bay got us in the freaking Super Bowl. You know what I mean? So, yeah, it happens. I, this does not surprise me one single bit. There's rumors uh, that um, back in the days versus Green Bay in the early 60s with the Raiders that there was an actual uh, Raiders person on the sidelines of the Green Bay Packers sideline. You know, uh, and they were called the entertainment referee, whatever person, just like the Cowboys. They called him the battery replacer for the referees or the entertainment <laughs> timeout person. Yeah. And, you know, maybe he's sneaking with the cell phone that you could see. But there was rumors that the Raiders did it many years ago. So I, I appreciate you saying that. But look at the referee. I mean, is that not a helmet to helmet hit on a running back? It was not called. The referee is right there. It was, it's just a very weird game. Well, you know, I think that I was talking about this with my buddy David who was over watching the game uh, earlier this, this week. We were watching the Steelers game. And, I, they, you know, we were talking about how things, you know, can influence your fandom of the league. And I was telling them about how, you know, some of the rules that the NFL has put in this year has been one of those things that's kind of tested my fandom a little bit. You know, this is not the sport – 
that you and I grew up watching. And it's certainly not the sport uh, of the of the set. I talked about the Raiders and that physicality that they played with uh, back then. This is not that football anymore. And and I don't necessarily like all these rules changes and these things. I'm all about protecting the players and all that kind of stuff. But when you when you get into situations where you can't land on a quarterback on a tackle, like that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of in my life. You know what I mean? I understand not picking him up and driving him into the ground, but there's optics involved. There's the eye test. Does it was what that person did malicious trying to hurt the other individual? And if the answer to that question is no, then keep the goddamn flag in your pocket. And so I think that those types of things from the helmet to helmets now to the roughing the quarterback you see early on like the first half of this year the flags were flying like crazy and now they're starting to let up a little bit now they're starting to let we're now we're in december it's a playoff push nobody i don't care what official you are nobody wants to be the reason that said team gets kept out of the playoffs because of a stupid flag on a on a on a hit like that or whatever so yeah, you know what I'm saying? So I think that it's – I don't think this is a, a singular issue. I think this is more of a widespread thing we're starting to see in the league now that they're kind of letting them play a little bit more now, and that's a good thing. Let them play. It's freaking football. From my point of view, it just seems like every year there's new rules that helps the NFL manage and control games. Whether you want to say they rig them or not, they're every year some sort of a decision that technically helps the NFL – kind of manage games and it just scares me but uh i want your first thoughts on this keith smith in a press conference or on a show for the raiders wore a make fullbacks great again shirt uh i had issues with it and i'll explain for multiple reasons of course i did i was just wondering what are your first thoughts on that like did it bother you you enjoyed it it it's funny it's funny. Like it's, it, yeah, make fun. I've, I, you don't know this, but I played competitive softball for a long, long time. I'm not, I just retired this last year, but there was a team that this, this year that wore hats that said, make softball great again. Like it's just taking, it's just taking a slogan that's, that's become famous in our political climate and just, and applying it to whatever thing you are interested in. So no, there is nothing to this other. This is like the rich eyes and punters or people two shirts. You know what I mean? This is just, and you guys a fullback, the fullbacks practically don't exist anymore. And so, you know, he's bringing a little bit of awareness to that and having some fun with it. And I can tell you this, I've interviewed Keith Smith. Keith Smith has been on Raiders fan radio. Uh, He's a great guy, super funny guy and really good sport, light heart, light spirit. And so this is perfectly in line with, you know, the kind of guy he is. So no, I don't think there's anything to this other than he's just having fun because he's like one of four fullbacks in the freaking NFL anymore. Yeah, I could, I mean, I 100% understand the jokingness of it, the nature of it, but in today's climate, you know, political jokes, they're kind of not well received by certain people. And again, it doesn't matter what they yourselves. think or whatever, but me for the Raiders coming off that Washington game, I still think something happened politically and I still think remnants are in the locker room. And it, for some darn reason, it bothered me like 20%. I was like, no, I don't want to revisit that. Get it out of the locker room. Nah, nah yeah, I think that you're they're making, making something out of it. That's completely not go back to, if you look and check Raiders fan radio, you check out, I'm going to plug, plug my show. Murph's fan cave. Look at episode number 72. That is the interview with Keith Smith. It was, uh, we did that in March of this past year. So just however many months ago that is, what, nine months ago, we interviewed Keith Smith. And he's a super, super cool guy. Like, no, this has nothing to do with politics whatsoever. Yeah, again, to me, I just, I just bothered me a little bit. And I was like, why? Like, you know, I would have thought about bringing it into the Raiders locker room. Because I don't know if Derek Carr or some other players still have issues with that type of political statement. But, hey, it's all in good fun and we got a victory, so let's move on. I love this fan dedication. This guy made it. A pitcher wore it on the sidelines uh, for the Chiefs game, and he wrote, Raiders, Chiefs tickets, check. Survived 7.2 Alaskan earthquake, check. And then he was hoping for a Raiders win to check off that box. But, you know, in a losing season, I love stuff like this, even especially against the Chiefs, who they all thought we couldn't win, and it was a close game. Uh, your thoughts on this? Just Raider fandom. I love it. Yeah, me too, man. Um, uh, so thankful for the listeners to to our show. 
course, the ones here for, at Mondays with Mikey and Murph and uh, those to the rest of the, the Murph fan cave shows like Raiders Fan Radio because I got a lot of correspondences last week from our listeners that uh, were out there at the game, met up with each other, like aside from anything that I was involved with, just on their own accord, got in touch with one another and, and, and had meetups and took pictures and and yeah, that's the, I'm a fan of fandom. I'm a fan of the Raiders, and I've said it multiple times, and I'll say it again, and I'll I'll leave it alone. You know, Mikey, um, if you're dependent solely on not you, I'm gonna say it twice now this show the proverbial you, if if you're solely dependent on the performance of the team, if you're solely dependent on the Raiders ch- checking that box like in this picture and getting that win, if you're solely dependent on that to for your fandom, then you're gonna be in you know a world of hurt because only one team wins a Super Bowl every year. You're gonna be let down repeatedly, uh, and instead you know invest your fandom in in the fans and in the fandom itself and in Raider Nation, and that will never let you down. Raider Nation will never let you down. We literally are one big family, and it's a beautiful thing, man. The fans, the fans of the Raiders are are unique. No one does it like we do. And so, no, I, I'm again. That's there's a reason our show is called Raiders Fan Radio because we freaking love Raider fans. I am 100 percent with you. Uh, I rely on victories lately, but uh, <laughs> I'm definitely I'm definitely an LA Raider fan. I love the noir, the lore, whatever they call it about about that era, man. All right, so here it is. There's the headline. Let's get into our weird hey, headline game can, recap. What's up, Murph? Because you said something on that. Can I ask you something as an L.A. Raiders fan? Let's, well, I'm a Raiders fan, but thank well, you. Well, yes, but I mean, but your fandom was formed in L.A. How do you feel about LeBron rocking a Raiders, a Los Angeles Raiders hat this week? I did not see that, but um. Yeah, he was walking into walking pop- into the to the to the. It's not the forum anymore, but whatever Staples Center where they play, right? Yeah, wearing a freaking L.A. Raiders hat. Well, you know, I mean, think about it from a branding statement. He's going to be, a, he's going to end his career in basketball, probably in LA. He's got a son that's going to play at high school out here. Uh, he's going to do media marketing. He's a producer now of TV content on the, on cable and all that other stuff. So, you know, he's bought in. So why not buy into a lot of the leftover LA Raider fans that really make up this community? You might as well try to please them as well. So He's doing a marketing move and all that. Is he 100% like a tri- from birth or teenage years a 100% Raider fan? No, he's doing it for marketing statement yeah, he's and a all that other Browns thing. guy, man. He's a Cleveland guy, so he's a Browns fan, we, right? Yeah. Yeah. But. He's trying to replace Kobe. And for a lot of <laughs> L.A. Laker fans, that's something hard to do. So he's trying to get in there where, where he can. Okay, uh, and now you talk about the media being um, mean people. You're completely right. Uh, I don't want to say it. You know, I've done it on occasion, but this picture and this Twitter post proved it from Matt Schneidman. He wrote our, meaning their employee, Crab took this phenomenal photo of John Gruden, where John Gruden is looking crazy. That means they called that a phenomenal photo. That means they were looking for it. They're proud to get it, and they're going to use it in the future against Gruden. <laughs> Man, you get completely wrong and mean. What? Well, I don't. Okay, listen, and and I, I promise I'm not trying to be a name dropper. Frank Sinatra once told me, "Don't be a name dropper." Uh, Matt Schneidman's been on my show. Matt Schneidman, I've I've interviewed, and he's not that. Guy. This is not malicious intent here. He's a super fun guy. He's a young guy. He's a, a New York guy. He's you know, and when I say he's young, I mean like he graduated college like last year. Like this is his first job out of college. So he's a young guy on the beat. He's working with Jerry McDonald at the at the Mercury News. He's not that kind of a guy. He's 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 he's, he's fun, and I think he just means that like you know they got this picture and he's like this is a phenomenal picture and it is, it's funny. Everybody everybody else yeah. is gonna take that picture now and use it against Gruden. Maybe, Maybe not Matt. Everybody yeah. else. Yeah, they might make a meme out of it or something. But I, you know, look, man, like, how many goofy pictures are there of us out there? You know what I mean? You know. So I'll give him one now. <laughs> Oh <laughs> boy, Mikey. There you go. There you go. I don't know. I just thought it was funny. I was like, oh my God. I'm trying to get off the Gruden hate. So I got mad when I saw this. I'm like, oh great, more Gruden hate. I would I'm doing my best. Glad you're sticking up for him. That's pretty good. I'm trying. You know, positivity, brother. You brought it to my life. <laughs> uh I was disgusted when I saw ah. 
it looked like more Steeler fans uh. from the TV than Raider fans. It, it felt kind of sad. Uh, yeah. Your thoughts on this? I don't know if it was real. I wasn't there. I can't prove it. But on the TV, I just saw after a Steeler yeah. touchdown, I saw a flag. And I was like, are you kidding me? I see more gold than silver and black. Yeah. Uh, Raider Nation, let's have a little talk. Let's let's let let's have sit down here next to Uncle Murph, man. Let's 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 have a chat. All right. I understand that the team isn't performing the way that you wanted them to perform this year. I understand that. And I understand that you have a sizable investment in your season tickets and your PSLs. And I will never tell you what to do with your money. But when you sell your tickets to Steelers fans that come into town to watch their team, this is the result of that. And as a fan and as a, uh, a guy who grew up in this stadium, literally, for A's games and everything else, my first concert was at, at the Oakland uh, Coliseum Arena next door. My first baseball game was here. My first football or not my first football game, but my first Raiders game was there. Like, I have a lot of history in this, in this stadium, okay? I have never on TV nor in person ever seen it that populated with another team's colors. I've been to games where I actually felt bad for other people, the Jets in particular, a Jets game. I felt bad for a, people that wore the opposing team's color because I f- actually feared for what was going to happen to them. That's not what was going on here. Now, look, you're not Nashville, okay? Now, follow me on this, Mikey. I live outside of Nashville now, okay? Nashville is a destination city. People come here from all over the world to vacation and do the country music thing and to go do all these touristy things. And so Titans fans will sell their tickets to Steeler fan, Browns fan, whoever else, Minnesota Vikings fan. And those folks will come into town and they will turn their vacation into that uh, in around the game. So they'll go to the game, but then they'll be here for a week and they'll do all this other stuff while they're here. All right. Look, I mentioned earlier, you're not doing anything in Oakland. No one's vacationing from Pittsburgh to Oakland. Okay. So you don't have the same dynamic going on there. So Raider nation, I'm serious, man. I had a problem with this, Mikey. And, and look, I'm not in the habit of calling out Raider Nation. I just got done a minute ago telling you how much I love Raider Nation, and that hasn't changed in this segment. But what I can tell you, that that was a bad look. That was a bad look for us to see that many gosh darn terrible towels freaking waving around instead of people out there wiping their coolers with them in a parking lot. That was not a good look, Raider Nation. I mean, the sad, scary part about it is, is, you know, true blood Raider Nation, they say, you know, they'll never switch or they'll never change sides, and they always question other Raiders. Um, I'm going to throw a conspiracy out there. Maybe some people are closeted Steeler fans out there in Oakland. Some of them. And they decided, you know what? The Raiders are losing. Let's represent the Steelers in this game. They're kind of closeted Raider fans. You get it? So they came out yeah. for the Steelers. And the, and, just, Steel, and the Steelers travel well. Look, like, I mean, they do. you know, they do. And it doesn't matter what stadium they go to. And a lot of times, I mean, Except there's a handful, but maybe not like Cleveland or whatever. But for, there's a they're probably second to us, I would say, in in terms of being able to quote take over a stadium. You know what I mean? Like we're famous for that. We're Raider Kansas Nation is City famous. Too. Do what? Kansas City too, but I don't remember a but Kansas not City like this. out O dot co. Uh uh-uh. uh uh-uh. And can, and again, the Steelers are good at this. They're only they're only second to to maybe us, but not in our crib. That that is uh, it's unacceptable. I was that was disappointing, Mikey. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to get too much into it. I'll piss everybody off. But <laughs> I think I already did, I, but we're in it together. <laughs> I understand in a losing season. I, yeah, and again, it's their but, money. I mean, look, I look. If you can make your money back on your season tickets for one game, what I I get it, I, and I don't begrudge that at all. I'm a capitalist at heart. I don't. I can't. Again, I'm not going to tell anybody what to do with their money. But just it's still whatever led to it just didn't look good, man. It just didn't look good. Yeah, I mean, I would have sold my tickets too, but you know, maybe I should have had an interview process. You know, are you a Steeler fan? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. if you are a Steeler fan, the tickets are not a hundred dollars; they're like five thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> you <know? laughs> uh, but in a good in a good aspect to this story. If the Steelers did officially take it over and it was more Steeler fans, they got the heart That's pushed right. out. They got beat from us. So I'm kind of glad now that it was more Steelers because yeah. we whooped their butt. That's right. They'll teach you to come to Oakland. There you go. They ain't coming back. Well, neither are the Raiders. <laughs> neither are the Raiders. <laughs> wow, that's so sad. Uh <laughs> 
Oh, oh Mikey. No, I can't no wait to read Oakland. the chat after this episode. That was a good maybe, one, though. That was maybe good. Maybe Pittsburgh should come to Oakland. Maybe yeah, they should go. transfer from the NFL. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they, they sell out the ODOT Coach Stadium every week. But the Raiders sell it out every week. That's why I'm confused. Yeah. I don't know what happened. I don't know. Uh, Steelers, according to the official report, they missed the field goal kick due to a slippery field or whatever. But they said they won't use the field conditions as an excuse. So the Steelers, the coaching staff, the players are apparently taking the high side. But the fans are not. The fans are claiming, you know, all the excuses in the world just like us. So I ask this question. Did the field conditions cost the Steelers game, Murph? And according to your story earlier, we started the cheating. Did we kind of like in an Al Davis way make the field conditions bad for the wide receivers and the running backs and all that? Do you think we might have sabotaged them a little bit? Because if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. I just want to know your thoughts. Yeah, you know, the uh, the field conditions have never been great. And Madden is famous for saying that, look, if they ever wanted to, the other team wanted to believe that we were watering down the field, then we weren't going to advise them otherwise. We were going to let them get in their own heads. And if that's what they wanted to think, then that's what they could. But this, this has been going on forever. This has just happened this year. You know, as I mentioned, this is the Coliseum, man. I practically grew up there, and it's always had bad field conditions. You know what we I didn't mean? Have, yeah, we had a lot of rain recently, so that really yeah. affected it. But in my lore, my fandom, back to what you said, I'm kind of open. I'm kind of gru- – I'm hoping Gruden is starting uh, to play games. He's coaching now. He's like, we can mess up the field. It doesn't <laughs> matter. We're losing. We got cleats for this type of field. They won't know what hit them. Let's mess it up a little bit. Yeah, you know, I I don't think anything was intentional, but I, and I definitely don't think it cost him the game. I mean, look, this guy's this kicker has been struggling all year long. You know what I mean? And he's and I mean, look at he, you know, it was more than just this blocked kick at the end of the game that cost them. What did he miss one earlier? And then he he barely snuck in an extra point, right? He doinked one off the dang upright. So, um, but anyways, you ever notice? You ever notice this? Here's here's one for you, Mikey. Speaking of the of the Raiders and the field conditions and the facility. You never noticed that when you were looking, watching a Raider game, and they shine the 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 camera down the uh, down the barrel of the goalpost, looking at the black hole. You ever notice that the goalpost looks like it's crooked? You ever notice that? Next I mean, time you're watching a Raider game and they're sh- looking at the black hole on a field goal kick, and I think it has to, I think it's an optical illusion from the way that because the the stands don't go parallel to the end zone, right? It kind of curves a little bit, like curving from the S in Raiders up towards the R in the end zone. If you think of it like that, it's actually curving. They're not curving, but it's it's on a, a separate track away. It's Ving away from it, right? And so I think because of that, when you look at the goalpost, it looks like it's oink, looks like it's crooked a little bit. It cracks me up, man, because it's like all the bad time that we get about about the the, the conditions of the Oakland Coliseum. I'm like, yeah, we got crooked goalposts to boot we can't even get our goalposts straightened out wow i didn't know that i'm gonna yeah. look that's yeah, gonna be check it out. It's pretty funny but that would be a good advantage if we had crooked goalposts like to one side <laughs> like if it was crooked to the right i would have our kicker daniel carlson kick to the right yeah and there's a guy up there there's a guy up there with a little joystick that's like you're angling it one way or the other depending on who's going up there to kick <laughs> oh it looks like daniel kicked the ball wide left hold on <laughs> hold on yeah. <laughs> uh, look at this Twitter post. They posted a picture on the Steelers, the final game score, and then Le'Veon Bell liked it. That's pretty funny. That's, that's, awesome. that's some good trolling right there. I'm 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 always a a fan of a good troll, and uh, that's a good one. Yeah, uh, Le'Veon Bell. You know, in terms of money, he knows the Raiders are going to have a lot of cap space. You know, he's trying to get paid, and you know, he's hoping the Raiders will come a Colin. Man, can you imagine Le'Veon Bell and Chris Warren Jr. the third in the same backfield? Ooh. And Marshawn uh, there just for kicks? Oh, my gosh. I don't, I don't know, man. I don't really want Le'Veon Bell to be quiet. I don't either, kick. but, man, he's he a good for you. Team he's a good. Sorry, cut you off. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't, he's a really good football player. I'm with you. I don't like the the, the every all the conditions of, of him as a, as a person and his agent, whatever. I don't care for him, but he's a really good football player. Yeah, I don't know what's going to happen. It's going to be a fun offseason. Uh, and I just wanted to let you know, Steeler Nation. Oh, can I believe I said it? Steeler Nation, I'm talking to you. Read what Bart Simpson wrote. Get it through your head. Take that word from your damn team's vocabulary. Get rid of it. You guys need to stop saying it. There's only one nation, and it's the Raider Nation, Steelers. Amen, brother.
Amen. You know, it's Steeler country. It's Chiefs kingdom. It's Niners faithful, right? They all, everybody's got their starting to have their own little marketing term. And that's fine. You go and do your thing. But they, you're right, Mikey. And it drives me bananas. I'll never forget, never forget the day that Stanford Route became a Kansas City chief. And he tweeted out something like, Chiefs Nation, what's up? And I'm like, you fool. You fool. I'm like, you've been wearing the silver and black and playing for our team for how long? And you don't know there's only one Raider Nation? I'm like, drives me nuts, man, when people mix this stuff up. Absolutely. Oh. He ain't a Raider at that point. In his mind, I'm getting paid by the Steelers, and I'm going to please their damn fans. Wow, that's disrespectful. All right, Rodney Hudson, here's his PFF stats. We don't really have to go over everything. because MVP, is- buddy, right there. MVP of our team. Should go to the Pro Bowl, man. I hope we can get yep. him in. Um, yep. Carl Joseph had another amazing game. Yeah. Uh, Gary on Conley balled out, in my opinion, again, against um, Antonio Brown. Your thoughts on Gary on Conley, the defense building a chemistry, and your initial thoughts of this game in, as a whole? Yeah, well, I'm really thankful for the the play of Gary on Conley. I was afraid that this was going to be another wasted draft pick, and especially another first rounder. I thought, you know, he was kind of in the doghouse, and he, you know, he only played a couple couple games his, his rookie year, and you know, here was the trade rumors, and with the, all the other players that were getting get that the Raiders were parting with, I thought, oh man, here we go, we're going to lose Conley, but. Talk about a turnaround, dude. I mean, whatever was that clicked with him has clicked with him and Gunther. And then the same thing with Carl Joseph, man. So the, both of these guys are be to, to be commended. And I am so thankful for them. Uh, man, that, I mean, dude, do you remember the last time we played the Steelers before this? Do you remember that game? Uh, they won 38-35 or whatever. Do you remember? I was in Pittsburgh, though. Antonio Brown had like 186 yards or something. What was his st- – I don't even know it. What was his stat line? And Gary and Conley was on. How do you take away, how do you neutralize Antonio Brown, one of the best wide receivers in football, if not the best wide receiver in football? And he freaking took him away for the most part, man. So, dude, like, that's money. Like, it, th- that yeah, he is. Had, he had under uh, just a shy over 60 yards, Antonio Brown. Which is a quiet day for him. For, an, for Antonio Brown, for a future Hall of Famer like him, that's a quiet day. I'll tell you, Comdy, Comdy, Conley is quickly moving into Namdi territory in terms of stats, in terms of, um, you know, allowing, uh, uh, you know, completion percentages and things like that. It's like I read the other day, man, in the pro football focus era, like he's only second to Namdi. Like, I mean, Conley's money, dude. I'm, I'm so thankful for him. I, I think it's been great. 100% agree. The previous three weeks before this game, he held whatever wide receivers he was against to 15 yards in three games. Wow total wow. and now Ga- Gary on Conley has just proven himself to be a shut down corner and I was and I was I'm not sure. on that train to begin with he was not I was not happy about that pig we talk about owning our criticism I did not want I was linebacker heavy that draft I'm like please goodness let us draft a freaking linebacker and we pulled Gary on Conley and I'm like what who's this guy you know but and then now I, I know just want to yeah again I'm thrilled man the defense like I said the Gruden's been coaching his butt off Gunther, whatever players are there, they're building a chemistry. And, like, the cancer's removed, it feels like. It feels like they're starting to heal. And that's what I'm proud of. And in retrospect, I also wanted to mention kudos to John Feliciano. Um, Osemele yeah. was inactive before the game. Feliciano had to come in. He got injured late, and he stayed in the game. I don't true know the injury of his ankle, but stayed in the game for four big plays with an injured ankle because we had nobody else to, to take over for him. And we got the go ahead touchdown and won the game. Feliciano, we got, we got Raiders on this team now. Yes. Good. Great, great job. Uh, calling him out Mikey in a positive way and giving him accolades. Cause there, there you go. Owning our criticism. I've on this show Mondays with Mikey Murph. How many times have you heard me uh, rally against Mongo Feliciano and his, you know, inability to protect and his penalties and whatever. So for the fact that not only did he, did he play well, but he gutted it out the way that he did. Cause I I'm with you. I mean, you could see it. Him and Jackson were both limping there at the end of the game. And I'm thinking, Oh no, oh, yeah, what, what if he comes out? What are we going to do? And he did man. And they hung in there for those last plays. And so props to those guys, man. Like you said, that's, that's freaking Raider football, man. That was, that was awesome. That's the fight in the dogs now that yes. we have on this team. Yes. And like I said, I'm proud of it. I'm having a good time watching this. So 
Let everybody know about the Raiders having a big victory, Johnny Drama. No matter what we deal with in life, as long as we push through, have some pride, some faith, we can get together and have a what? Thank you, God. Victory! That's what I'm talking about. This is Victory Mondays with Mike and Murph. There it is, Carl Weathers. You brought, <laughs> I forgot Carl Weathers played for the Raiders. You know, Action Jackson, Rocky Lore, Apollo Creed played for the Raiders. So I went out and found this picture, and now I got to get that football card. So thank you so much for bringing me to that Murph. That is an amazing picture. That is now my Christmas wish list card. Oh, that is awesome, man! Yeah, that's that's uh, that's pretty cool, man. And what was his uh, what was his name in Happy Gilmore? I was just trying to look up that. Uh, Wasn't it Poppy? No, something like that. Oh my gosh! I'm trying to, tr- I'll I'll have I'll have it looked up here in a minute. Shame on me for not knowing his his character's name off the off the. Yeah, he loses his hand. Yeah, he loses his hand, and uh, oh man, it's such yeah, Carl Weathers, man, awesome dude. Absolutely. And he went, it was funny. I like actors that are willing to do things like this where, I mean, he was a man's man, like in Rocky, right? Like in the Rocky movies, like his Apollo Creed, like he was a stud and obviously former NFL player and whatnot. And then to go and do something, uh, Chubbs, that's what it was. It was oh. Chubbs. And so to go play something like Chubbs in, uh, in Billy Madison to be a good sport about something like that. A uh, very, very cool, man. Very cool. I've actually reached out to him. I'd love to interview Carl Weathers, man. He, what a, what a cool guy. Again, Murph has a hit list in case some of you haven't seen previous shows. <laughs> yeah. He has a hit list of like amazing Raider players, reporters, talent that he's trying to get interviews for. He already has a ton of amazing interviews on his channel. And kudos to you. So again, check it out. Murph Fan Cave on YouTube. Check it out. He's got some amazing stuff. He's got a whole collage of stuff that you can re-listen to. You're building a good archive, brother. Thanks, man. Appreciate that, Mikey. Thank you very much. Well, I'm a, a nerd. I stay at home a lot. I got no girlfriends right now. I like to play video games. I remember video games. And apparently, I want a Christmas gift from anybody. Uh, <laughs> I want my rent to be paid. That's the most important there thing. There you go, because you don't but, like um, to pay it. Yeah, no, I don't like to pay it at all. But apparently, there's a company called One Up Arcade, and you can buy like smaller versions, three fourth versions of arcade games at home. They're like 300 to $350. To me, that's kind of an amazing price. And there's their initial assortment of arcade games. And I want one. One of them's on my Christmas list, and I'll talk about it in a minute. So that brought me to the question, what is your favorite arcade game of all time? Wow. You know, well, out of these that are listed here, you know, Asteroids was is a lot of fun, man. Asteroids holds up well. As simple of a game as it is, it actually holds up pretty well, but... I think Gauntlet was my favorite as far as like as a kid going to the arcade with a pocket full of quarters back in the day. Google it for those younger folks out there. You know, do you know what I mean? Like back in the old days, man, we would go to the go to the arcade, man, with our with our, our our quarter, our rolls of quarters, man, and you could spend all day there, huh, Mikey? It was it was a blast, man. And um, I used to play Gauntlet a lot. Gauntlet, the wizard needs food. You know what I mean? I would <laughs> I would play the heck out of Gauntlet, man. That was a that was a great game. It was a four player game, and it was a, it was definitely a communal experience. You know, because a lot of video games back then, it was like waiting your turn. You would put your quarter up on the little ledge there to let somebody know that you got next kind of a thing right like there was a lot like but there wasn't a lot of uh, like playing with people there was you could play kind of like take your turn but there wasn't like we could all go together and do but gauntlet was one of the first games like that so you could like have all four people working together and uh there you go man yeah that that was that was fun so and then not only do you get gauntlet on this one but then you get rampage which it was before it was a rock uh, johnson movie it was a freaking video game and you got joust and defender which is killer defender was cool because back then the games would always scroll one way defender was cool because you could reverse directions and so you could go and you could fight the game both directions, man. That was cool. That's how simple times were back then, for, uh, folks. For us guys, for us old guys, man, just being able to go another direction in a video game, we were like, yeah. <laughs> so which one of those, if you had an extra four hundred dollars, 
to buy, would you buy and put in your home out of the one up arcade list for your home? Yeah, give me that give me that rampage gauntlet joust and defender game, man. That's that one's pretty and even joust was fun, flying around with the birds and the eggs and all that kind of the stuff. Horses, yeah, you gotta kinda of yeah, the platforms. Yeah. yeah, that was pretty cool. It wasn't my favorite game, but that was cool. And Rampage was was pretty fun too. But so but for Gauntlet and Defender alone, uh those two, that uh, those are those are great games. How about you? What do you got? Uh, in terms of those on screen, I want them all, uh, but <laughs> I, I ain't got the money. I literally got my little studio garage here, and I would love to put like all five of them. They're only three fourths, and you got to buy something for fifty dollars to make them bigger. And the monitor is um, seventeen and a half inches, and a standard arcade game back in the days was twenty inches, so it's a little uh -huh. bit smaller. But um, if I could only afford one out of those, I kind of got good at Street Fighter Champion Edition at my local 7-Eleven, so I would do that. But you're right. Gauntlet, Joust, and Defender are interesting. So it's 1944. It has Ghost and Goblins. You can't read it. And Strider. Those are kind of interesting games. Oh. I want them all, but I would buy, if I had the money, Street Fighter 2. But my favorite arcade game growing up was Sinistar. Oh, I remember that one. Yeah. I I beat this game. It took me like about $119. <laughs> I figured it out, but I beat it. I literally beat the Sinistar at the end, collected the, I think it had like this gold coin in the middle of the Sinistar. But I, I just remember it. I beat it. I was like, oh my God, nobody was there. I was like, I want to live my championship. But I only got the guy that runs the liquor store. I'm like, hey, Don. His name was Don Lee. I'm like, Don. I beat Sinistar. He goes, oh, you want another Chocodile? I said, no, I beat Sinistar. I don't want another Chocodile. I beat Sinistar. He goes, oh, Chocodiles, we don't have them no more. Because that's oh what I did. I, I lived on food stamps. Um, oh. So my dad would give me a dollar food stamp, and then we would take the dollar food stamp. I'd buy a Chocodile. It's like a chocolate treat. Yeah. It, cost, it cost a quarter. So then I'd give him the dollar food stamp. They'd give me three quarters back. And that was my exchange rate. Oh to play my gosh, you were in, you were in heaven as a kid, man. That's awesome, dude. That's, I love it. I love it. Uh, hey, do you have um? Do you guys have? I'm sure you do. Somewhere you're in Los Angeles for crying out loud. Uh, we have an arcade here. It's called Flashback Arcade, and for ten bucks you get a wristband, and they have all these games, all of the games from the '80s, in this big giant warehouse, and you can play all of them for free. And you can come and go as you please. And so, like, I'll take my kids down there, man, and we'll just go. And I mean, they have everything. Paperboy and Tapper and all kinds of pinball and, like, I mean, all the games. Like, literally all the games. There's not, like, not one game from the 80s that you could think of that they don't have, man. It's so fun. It is absolutely yeah, we, a blast. Dig Dug have, and Qbert and all that stuff, man. We have places. I don't know if it's called Flashback, but there's a couple of them. And we've got one arcade in my neighborhood called Malibu, but they got all that new stuff, all those little, for the tickets, all the little games. I don't like none of that stuff. I'll tell and you. My last favorite game was Karate Champ. I just wanted to share that. I beat that one, too. What about really what about Double Dragon? That was a good karate game. You remember that one? You had the guy in the white gi and the guy in the red gi? Yeah, I thought Double Dragon was a scroller where they walked and punched. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't a fighting game. Yeah, you went along. But that was another one you could do it together. Like, you could work, oh, yeah. you could work the game together. That was... That was a pretty fun one. Wow. I don't know. I'm good memory. I'm loving Mikey. reminiscing. I'm loving this dude. Yeah. This happy. Uh, you're in Nashville. So yeah. before the Bengals game, uh, apparently there's a Raider uh, watching event. So I just wanted to represent it to anybody in the neighborhood. It's at music city. They're from music city, Raider nation. There's the address on screen. Start Sunday, December 16th at 12 PM versus the bungles. So there it is. Go support. Raider Nation, maybe you can get out there, Murph. Who knows? Yeah, thank you for doing that. That's very nice of you to, to bring that up. I, I don't know these folks, and, uh, you know, we take pride in knowing a lot of the booster clubs, and I'm kind of ashamed to say I don't know the one in my own backyard. Um, but uh, I reached out to him earlier today. when I, You sent me this link, and I, I appreciate you doing that. And I reached out to him, and, uh, yeah, so, so pretty cool. I mean, you know, we're everywhere. You know, you can't uh, you can't go anywhere and not find Raider Nation, man. We are everywhere. And so pretty cool that these folks are uh, and this I know where this place is, too. It's right downtown. I mean, it's it's right in the middle of where the draft is going to be this year. There so, you go. So absolutely. A, yeah. If you have the time off, Murph, head, you know, yeah, if you're able to get out there, get on out there, get some interviews for your channel and be even better 
at your fandom because you're amazing. Well, I appreciate you saying that. And, uh, you know, we got some folks coming through town, too, that are going. Uh, Kevin, the Raider nerd, uh, is going to come through. He'll actually be here in the fan cave. We had our first guest in the fan cave this last week, my buddy David Northrup, <laughs> a drummer uh, who's a uh, – you know, literally, you know, nationally and and uh, probably globally known. He plays for uh, all kinds of different country music folks and Boz Skaggs. And he's, I mean, Travis Tritt, I mean, you name it. His, his list of credits is huge. Anyways, he's a Steeler fan. So we had him come in and uh, we talked to him a little bit about the rivalry. Uh, but anyways, Kevin, the Raider nerd, is going to Cincinnati and he's going to be driving through town. So he's going to stop in and spend some time with us in, uh, here in the fan cave before he heads on to Cincinnati. So anyways, I, I appreciate you saying that, man. And it's, that's it's it's pretty cool. I know that um, I don't know where I've never seen the demographic sheet of who listens to Mondays with Mikey and Murph mostly. I don't know if YouTube gives us that or not. Nine year olds. <laughs> but when on our podcast, it breaks down where people listen to us from. And the majority of our listeners are in Southern California, oddly enough. Um, but the rest of it is pretty balanced and it's all over the place. And when you look at where Raider nation is concentrated all up and down the Eastern seaboard, um, you know, the Midwest, Chicago, all that surprisingly, there's a lot of Raiders fans there. Texas is loaded with Raiders fans. We get tons and tons of correspondence and, uh, and listens from, uh, from Texas, man. So yeah, we're all over the place, man. We are in your backyard, uh, as Raider nation. That's awesome. Um, yeah, YouTube, generally has nine and 10 year olds on everything. So that's why I made that joke. And then in terms of having an, I'd love to have an interview in my studio and we didn't have an inside the Raider nation this week. I just want to apologize personally to watch Raider. Uh, I was supposed to get that interview done with you on Saturday and I'm a mesh. So that's all I can say, brother. There's my apologies. There's another Texas guy, right? There's a, there you go. Like that's a perfect example right there, man. I'm telling you, Texas is loaded with Raider fans. Yeah, so it is what it is. All right. Uh, should we? Could we? Now that we're in a, tie, a dead heat tie for the first, second, third pick, basically, I don't know. Uh, if the Raiders win again, according to experts, we're going to push ourselves <laughs> out of the top five picks. I, of course we want to win, but I'm just going to throw this out there because people like to talk about it. Bengals versus Raiders. Could we? Should we? Uh, we're in a dead heat tie. We're still at number two for the draft pick. I don't know your thoughts on this game and can we win? Should we win? Let's just talk. I, I think we're going to win the Super Bowl now. You know what I mean? I've touched that game against hey, Pittsburgh. the odds went up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, now, nah, you know, the Raiders, I say this all the time. The Raiders every year lose a game we shouldn't lose and we win a game we shouldn't win. We lost to the 49ers was a game we shouldn't have lost. We got blown out on national TV. And then we beat the Pittsburgh Steelers in a game that we shouldn't have won. By all accounts, they are a much better team than we were. And frankly, if it wasn't for Roethlisberger missing four series and Josh Dobbs coming in there, we might have lost that game too, right? So, um, but I want to take away from the win at all. Uh, but that said, um, so we kind of, those have already happened. Now, Cincinnati is a very winnable game and I'm going to, my fandom is wound up, right? I hate the Steelers. A lot of Raider Nation. I'm not alone in that. We all hate the Steelers. And in fact, outside of our division, I probably hate them most of all. I hate them way more than I ever hated the Patriots because the Steelers is a much better and much more impactful rivalry than the Patriots are and or were. Google it, Raider Nation, if you don't believe me. Okay? So, that said, my fandom is now wound up because we beat the Steelers. So, I'm going to go out on a limb. You know I don't make predictions, Mikey. You know I'm terrible at it. But I'm going to say this. We beat the Steelers. We're going to beat the bungles we're gonna beat the donkeys and we're gonna go into arrowhead on a three game winning streak and threaten to knock them down as the number one seed in the nfl or the afc anyways and wouldn't that be nice wouldn't that be nice for our raiders to have something to play for because as of right now we just played our super bowl by beating the steelers we got another kind of halfway important game just because we hate the donks that we're playing them but, oh, if we could go in on a three-game streak and potentially win four in a row and close out the year on a win, on a four-game winning streak, and knock them out of the number one seed, Mikey, let's go, dude. How about that? I'm telling you, that is the positivity of winning versus the Steelers. That is the positivity of playing good against the Chiefs early on. So now going into that game, you're right. If we have a, a winning streak, no matter what, the Chiefs might be in the playoffs. We could beat them. 
Wow, you're blowing my mind here, Murph, with these, <laughs> with these predictions, Murph. Because I've been picking them to lose every week. For I like know, me weeks. too. It's all changed now. We're back. <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I got the, the victory over the Steelers, and I'm very happy. We got three wins. Maybe the season will end with three and 13, the number 33. You know, I can yeah. throw that out another different way. Uh, but I don't know if we should win. I'm kind of like, all right. We got some big victories, some close games. Now let's keep the number two draft pick. Let's keep it. <laughs> uh, so I'm kind of on the fence, but I want victories. I want what you to say to happen. It's good for views. It's good for my positivity. <laughs> it makes me feel good. It'll make me like Gruden a little bit more. So I don't know what to do. You got me freaked out now, Murph. Just got to believe, man. We just got to believe. Yeah, and you know what? Two, yeah, well, you know, I, I'm not worried about the draft, man. I want, I'll give us them Ws, man. We're only going to get so many of these for them to be the Oakland Raiders, and I don't want them to – look, I'm all in on them being the Vegas Raiders. Now, I don't like it. You know what I mean? It says stay in Oakland right over on my shoulder, but, you know, I get it. They're so – you know, they're but they're leaving, and so I'm all in with this team. But I want them to get as many as they can for Oakland, even if Oakland don't show up to see them. You know what I mean? I Ugh. still want us to get as many W's as we can. And just, and you know, to go out, every, you know, everybody wants to, you, you want to end on, on, a, on a good note. You know, you know, I always teach my kids finish strong. You know, whenever I was coaching them and we were, regardless of the sport, especially in baseball, you know, if we were doing batting practice, I'd always want them to end with hitting a rocket. Hit that line drive, hit that dinger, hit that one, just rope one out there, then we'll quit. You know what I mean? Like, we, you know, I don't care how many swings you've had. We want to end on a high note. We want to end strong and then carry that into the next thing, right? That way we can be better tomorrow than we were today because today we were better than we were yesterday. And that's, 100%. What, I, and that's what I believe about this team, man, that we're – look, this is a chance for us to build. You know what I mean? Like, we've had some decent moments, few, but there have been some decent moments this year, but we haven't built on them. We haven't built at all on anything. You know what I and mean? This, so the chance this will prove to the free agents that are coming in. Again, a couple of weeks ago, we were like, no free agent's going to want to come. No, no free agent's going to want to be under the debacle that's going on with Gruden, the purge, whatever. Now we're winning. Gruden is coaching. Uh, Raider Nation's getting inspired. This would help that's free yeah. agents want to play for the Raiders next year and take a contract. Absolutely. One hundred percent right. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Look, we're not going to win anything. You know, we're not going to. We're not going to win the draft. You can't win the draft. The draft doesn't tell us what happens in the draft until two, three now, years. We are going to be the first official team that 100% wins the draft. We're going to win all these three games. We're going to win the draft and we're going to win the next year draft. Then we're going to win in Vegas and we're just going to keep on winning. There you go, Mikey. are the Raiders. And what is the hashtag? Just win, baby. All right. I'm talking they, about they Mikey. Game. I got to go run through a wall. I'll be right back. Boom. Mikey is like Madden. I'm a passionate <laughs> coach and like Gruden. Uh, just don't get me in a press conference. I'll say all the wrong things and I'll deflect. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's a little old at Gruden. But uh, the Bengals game is going to be tough. It's going to be in the cold outdoors. So we're going to find out how the Raiders can play probably in some, you know, some rough weather. And I expect it to be a good game. We're playing real good. Uh, X Factor. Uh, Derek Carr again. Yeah. He's on a roll. So your quick expectations and your X factor and your prediction. You already predicted a win, but yeah, I think that we're gonna win. You know, this could be a blowout. You know, I don't. Again, I'm not good at this stuff, but you know, the Bengals. Blowout. They got no quarterback. They got nothing. They got nothing, man. It's the Bengals. It's a Marvin Lewis coach team. They got nothing, and they haven't ever had anything. The guy hasn't won a playoff game as their coach. I mean, how do you – this guy's like, the, you know, another Jeff Fisher. Like, I, I, it's amazing to me how these guys keep their jobs. That's Breaking not news, amazing. Nick Mullins, Nick Mullins from the 49ers has been traded to the Bengals, and then they are going to beat us in a blowout <laughs> with Nick Mullins. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. There's no Southern Mississippi quarterbacks out there for them to get unless Favre is going to come out of retirement. Um, but, yeah, I just um, – yeah, I, 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 I look, it's pr it's probably just my fandom. I'll wound up, and that's why I'm a fan. I'm not a professional analyst. I'm not in anything. I'm a podcast host and a YouTube caster. And so, yes, I'm going to get all up in my feelings and think that the Raiders are going to win this freaking game based on the effort that we had and the execution that we had on the field. Look, Carr was dropping dimes this last game. Now, look, I, 
I'm sure he wants that one back that slipped out of his hands. But for anybody that has been critical of Derek Carr this year, you can eat it. You can stuff it. You can whatever you want to do with it. You can get to it. Do something with it because he was dropping dang dimes over the top to the, the pass to Seth Roberts to the the, the pass to Lee Smith, man. That and, and big old Lee Smith, Derek Carr's spirit animal, double catching the ball. How many the guys caught four passes, two of them for touchdown. Like, and I'm I'm joking because he catches it twice every time he catches the ball because it bounces out of his hands. And that was a great pass. Like it's it's great stuff, man. It's great stuff. I'm fired up for this football team. What's the X factor? Yeah, it's got to be Derek Carr. But also, let's give props though. De- defensively, Gary Conley, man, take away AJ Green. Is AJ still hurt? Is he even playing? No, they only got Tyler Boyd. That would be the. All only right. Two. Well, there we go. That was going to be a hard day for Gary Conley. He could take a nap and play that game with one hand. There it is, Raider Nation. We are fired up. Derek Carr's on a roll. The team is playing better. Our passions are through the roof. Mikey Raiders being positive about Gruden. Mikey Raiders being positive about everything. It is what it is. That's a victory Monday for you. So if this could happen more often, we are going to have more passionate, more fun, and more good times to come because we are the Raiders. And no matter what we go through, love each other, and we are Raiders for life. Murph, get on everybody out of here. Give some shout out. Say whatever you want to say. And then we're going to dance. And you need to rap. They want you to rap. Hey, I'm telling you, we got, we got one more game to do it. If we go into KC and beat Kansas City, I will be the rappingest fool on this on this show, man. You betcha. I will hold I up hope, my end I of that bet. Write a, will you write a rap and then we'll find a beat or something that won't be demonetized and you can actually do your written rap? Yo, I'm Murph. And I'm here to say <laughs> the Raiders won in a big effing way. I'm on Merck Fan Cave. You can catch me every day with an interview every day. I don't know. I, I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I got some, I got some, I got, I got some, some lyrics floating around in here. You know what I mean? Like, uh, like I'm not a hip hop guy, but I got some. Like, I remember some of the stuff from back in the day, man. There was, there was a lot of it that I, I did, I did like, and I could emulate that. You know what I mean? You could do the, you could do the first metal. Kansas City Raider rap version. Hey, Anthrax and Public Enemy did it, and I could follow suit, man. I'm in Raider Nation, so let's hope <laughs> for a big victory versus Kansas City Chiefs. We're going to hold him to it. That is your ode. All right, give some shout-outs. Get on out of here. Let everybody know what you're doing on Wednesday. Yeah, so Wednesday we do uh, Raiders Fan Radio. Please check us out. MurphsFanCave.com is where you can find links to all of our shows. But right here on YouTube, uh, me and uh, my Uncle Mosh will do uh, we'll do Raiders Fan Radio live for here from here in the Fan Cave. And so please subscribe to our channel, Murph's Fan Cave, there on YouTube. And uh, it's a lot of fun, man. We have, we have a good time. A lot of it has been... Um, inspired by Mikey man I, I can't thank you enough we used to just be a little old podcast oh, and then we started doing this live stream thing and uh, you you know you encouraged me to kind of branch out a little bit Mikey uh, you know and and I appreciate you for for doing that and kind of pushing me and nudging me a little bit to do that because with this face made for radio uh, this was not something I ever thought I would do would be on camera uh, doing uh, doing shows and uh, but we have done that and uh, it's been great man it's been a lot of fun and and the reason that I love it so much and Uncle Mosh loves it is because the engagement we get with our listeners with the chat room and the feedback that we get it's youtube is really cool um as a as a as a uh, a vehicle to do that and to everybody listening to the show now i, I want to tell you um because i i read in the chat every week i can't i get we see i read the shout outs and the hey what's up mikey murphy I can't ever engage with you during the show because I can't see it, but I always go back and read it after the show. So thank you to those of you that have watched us tonight. Thank you to those of you for your feedback, and I will enjoy going back during Monday Night Football, going back and reading through all your comments. Yeah, long story short, tonight we had some struggles. You guys know we started an hour late. Uh, I don't even have the chat room open. I wanted to save internet space. I don't know what's going on. But again, there's amazing fans out there, even of my channel as well. They've been supporting me. Each and every one of you, from the bottom of my heart, I hope you truly believe me. I love you. I thank you. Go out and show this guy some support, whatever way possible. Just keep supporting, and we'll keep loving you guys and hopefully making content as much as we can for the Raider Nation. Thank you guys for being a part of Mondays with Mike and Murph, and we will see you next Monday. All right. Let me sing. I like to sing. I like to get out of here and sing. Here we go. Because what? This was Monday. With Mikey Heesmer. We had a good time talking Raiders and football dirt. Cause I'm not an RB star, but I will take a girl real far. 
I will kiss and make love to her and tell her I'm the man. That's my plan. All right, y'all. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays.